uh, what, how many releases, interesting one, how many, I'll do one, like what, how many releases do you think, today we do three releases a year uh, for Kubernetes. Uh, and people say that that's too much, like uh, too fast to upgrade Kubernetes. Uh, how many uh, releases we had in the first year in 2014? Why is it in the screen, I guess? 20. Uh, 20 releases. Really? They keep tagging, right? Tag releases just a tag, like tag, tag, tag. Um, so yeah, they're at the bottom. I was collecting, seeing that. I went back in time. Um, and also um, here, like all these releases. Um, I'll uh, give two more things in here. In here, the first two links that you see here is uh, with James Prune, uh, uh, Spruny. Uh, we did two GitHub repos. You can download it. You can Git clone this or just do it on the on your computer. Is You can run the first patch of Kubernetes, Kubernetes C.1, uh, with a Linux VM, it works in Lima. Uh, it's a Lima, it's, you can run on your laptop, and also you can run version 1.0 and see how it was back then. No kubectl, no deployments, no namespaces. There were no namespaces, imagine that, right? Kubernetes without a CLI. Uh, it had a CLI like called CFG, cross CFG, but no CLI like we know today. No RBAC, no namespaces, <laughs> uh, no kubelet, uh, right? Uh, all those things were not there uh, in Kubernetes. And people say that Kubernetes is difficult, so I'll, um, I'll argue these, that. These two links for the 1.0 uh, releases were a big hit last night in the meetup as well, in the 10th birthday party. Oh, really? This, yeah, yeah. Um, everyone was like talking about them. To yeah, try. these ones you can yeah. do Kubernetes 1.0 and um, run an NGINX uh, pod. Um, and the instructions, there's a tutorial. There's a lima.yaml file that you start, and it's like a Linux machine in your computer, and it doesn't take that much memory. Uh, I think you can lower the memory. Go step by step, installing uh, Ubuntu or like installing Docker, installing the kubelet. Um, this one had more things than the previous one I was talking about. This one has the scheduler. This one looks like the one that we use today. 1.0 actually looks like the one that we see today, and a lot of the concepts are still the same. There's a pod. There's the, the components uh, together, uh, but it was a little bit difficult to to put together. That this was before Cube ADM, before Cube Minikube, before Kind, before Managed Service, <laughs> uh, the first release. Um, so I'll start with that. I'll start with that. Um, so yeah, check it out. I think it was a fun resource. Um, it's a file, and then like there's a trivia game, and there's like two things that you can play on your own. And um, you can say that if somebody asks you, what well, what's the oldest version of Kubernetes you have used? You can say 1.0, right? Easy. Um, and then we go to today's topic. Uh, today we have a new book. Um, I'll start sh sharing um, my screen and Sergio can share his screen and he can introduce himself. Um, and, and why the book. you wanted to write a book. <laughs> and yep. And, uh, <laughs> and if you can cover, like, introduce yourself, tell us um, about the book, what it is, and then also tell us, like, why you decided to spend time on your house or the place that you were writing and spending time uh, writing about Kubernetes instead of spending time, like, with your family and doing fun stuff. <laughs> okay. Uh, in an informal way, right? Yeah, in form, in form away. Okay, okay. Well, I am. Yeah, sorry. go ahead, share. You have <laughs> a you, you have a thing to share. Can you share your screen? I think you have a, a slide, ah. right, with the book. Go ahead, Sergio. Okay, um, I am Sergio from Guatemala. Um, I am CSS engineer here. Also a professor right now looking for a job. <laughs> I I used to work on DevOps. Right now I am looking for something different. Uh, also a CNCF ambassador. Uh, I love photography. <laughs> Author of a book. What else? Um, okay, you are sharing. What was your motivation? Like, why did you all, all of a sudden? Where's the title? I'm looking for the title. Yeah. 
Um, Where is it? I thought it was here somewhere. Why did Joel always have this? Yeah. But you're a professor. Uh, That's probably something you're quite yeah. <laughs> familiar with. Yeah, sorry. OK, OK, OK. So that's the book. <laughs> uh, let's say that, I don't know, uh, the people from PACT uh, contact me on LinkedIn. I think that was because I was pretty active on the CNCF community. And I think that they liked the idea that I was a professor. So for this kind of title was like a little bit like new or something different. So they were looking for someone that can tackle the title, let's say. So I made the proposal of, let's say that, that in the beginning, they wanted just to cover uh, K3S. And in that moment exists the K3OS. Right now, it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, so they were looking for that, but I proposed to modify the title a little bit because it was like a little bit closer to certain software. And because I am a professor, like said, he said, I included something more dynamic, something to learn and cover like different use cases to the book. And why I decided to take the time to write a book I think that I don't know if in your country says the same, but in Guatemala, people say that you have to do three things in life. Write a book, plant a tree, and have a, a child. <laughs> so something like that. Right <laughs> now I have a book. <laughs> so I wanted to take okay, a I, I got only two. I, ha I have two. two. So I guess now I, have, now I have more pressure to write a book. Yeah, um, Carlos, we should yeah. get writing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so that's one of the reasons I like, challenged myself. Let's say that I was like curious about this topic, but I didn't have like the opportunity to do something around it. So I said, mm, this looks like a good idea. Why not to take the risk? And to be honest, also, I take the time to write a book to do like extra points to be an ambassador. Yep, that's so, also useful, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what that contribution is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if so, you want to be a CNCF ambassador, like 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 writing content, writing books, uh, doing presentations, running communities, helping projects, so those things count. Um, yeah. So that's that's very interesting. One thing um, I will say, I remember I was um, a um, uh, a host for for a couple of KubeCon co-located events. I think you were doing some talks around. Uh, devices running Kubernetes or maybe Knative on a on a device. I remember you giving a talk. That was about around the time that you were writing the book, or you were playing with this technology and devices before writing the book. Yeah, I think that. Let me think. That was on 2022, I think, right? Uh, I think that I was finishing. Well, was in November. Yeah, one one month later than I finished the right to that the book was published yes so yeah let's say like for uh, to say that pack uh, say that was a good idea to do presentations around the topic to promote the book and everything and because i have like curiosity about this topic i try to do something different on each presentation and i also reuse the content of the book to create a new things so the thing that I presented in the Knative Con was yep. something similar to this, but in a different kind of use case, just to turn on and turn off a LED using a remote control, but running the thing on K3S and using Knative to temporarily execute that logic, let's say. So yeah, different couple of experiments around different conference and testing different things right now I am playing with food topic so how to automate how to create dishes and that kind of stuff plants farms and everything <laughs> yep. yeah yeah also, also the, the... The... go ahead mm -hmm. also in O'Reilly if you have the O'Reilly subscription you can access the book too yeah, you can get it in Amazon pack and then Sevi found out that if you have the subscription to O'Reilly, you can you can get it there. I was going to say that I have a bunch of devices at home. I have, I think the first one that I got was Raspberry, Raspberry Pi 2. 
I think I have one here, the three, I have the four. <laughs> I keep buying them and not using them. I mean, <laughs> my wife keeps saying like, stop buying <laughs> so many devices. Yeah. And I got the Turing Pi. Uh, and now I want to get an, an NVIDIA, like a, like a GPU, right? Um, but yeah, back then I was, I was part of the Knative project and uh, all the pieces to run Knative is still and, and Kubernetes was uh, too much resources. So that was one of the projects that I, I proposed to the, to the community to say like, let's find the smallest Kubernetes um, footprint that we can do and do it with uh, K native. Um, and I think at, at that point we came up with a replacement for Istio, um, for, for ingress controller. So that reduced the, the footprint. And then I was playing with K zero S and then I discovered K three S and we got, I got working K three S barely in a raspberry Pi three or two. I don't remember which one it was one of the two. Um, so that's the first, first incarnation of me working with Kubernetes, uh, on the edge. Um, here's my yeah, Carlos. <laughs> yeah, I think I have, I still have a few around. I have a Raspberry Pi twos. I have a, a bunch of nooks, which I'm changing the CPUs and I have a Turing Pi that I can take, uh, an NVIDIA module. That's why I want to get the NVIDIA, NVIDIA mo uh, nook because I can switch it. Um, mm -hmm. hey, well, what is K3S? Ah, we're going to learn that in this book. <laughs> yes. Uh, but K3S or, is yeah. one of the, one of the, go ahead, Sergio. Okay. Let's say that the book is, um, I think that maybe you can go to the index. Let me see. Or you want the, if I can share the, my screen now. Uh, or your share. I think you have, you have a better uh, view. Like you have some slides to share. So I'll stop sharing. Go ahead, Sergio and share. I think that, uh, okay. Let me see. Okay. And I put course. links in the in the doc to all these uh, Kubernetes distribution. I think I put in. I think I was before we started. I put a link to Cube Edge, K3S, K0S, Talos, uh, EKS Anywhere. So all of these are like uh, Kubernetes distributions that are very tiny to running tiny devices. Yeah, sound like. Interesting thing about this book is that I, let's say that before this book, I hated electronics. <laughs> I was oh, like really? trying, to, yeah, I was like trying to, oh, really? yeah. And I was, okay. So what's your time. background, uh, Sergio? What, what you were a professor, but you did a bachelor's and what's your study background? Um, well, let's say that here in Guatemala, the systems engineer explains like, it's not like this kind of careers. It covers more like science and computer stuff, like compilers, operating system, networking, uh, programming, structures, dynamic software. The, the software, computer science side. Okay, yeah. not I. I, I, I went. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like electronics because I did electrical electrical engineering. So I'm not a software. Oh, no. I did my my first. Education wasn't software or computer science or algorithm or math. It was electronics and uh, working with antennas, working with devices like this, working with FPGAs, uh, working with uh, multi multi phase uh, power lines. <laughs> and then I got somehow I got into computers and somehow I ended up now in the cloud. I'm work I'm, work, I'm living in the cloud. Uh, Let's say that. In, in my university, they have like three courses about electronics. So okay. not basic stuff, but not as much as an electronic engineer, let's say. So I have okay. like, and you know, in the university, some people knows about the electronics, other doesn't. So they make yep. groups and some people work, some other doesn't, some other people don't understand. So I was more in the middle. <laughs> So I understand the basic, but I didn't have like that space to play a little bit after the university. And I said, okay, why not to take the risk of cover this thing? Because I was thinking about the people that know electronics or maybe scientists that wants to implement something for their experiments and they want to know Kubernetes and they have to do something. Ah, for you. So that's the reason in the way that I structured the book. 
to cover, let's say that the book is designed for people that is not like systems engineer or people coming from elect electronic engineer or something like that. And they can learn some basics of both things in the book. So that's the idea of the book. Like more like, not academic, but, but a little bit. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, more um, hands-on. Uh -huh. So let me show you the, well, let, let's open the book. <laughs> this one is a, a review version. Uh, okay. Okay. So the book has three parts are subdivided the first. Yeah, I have a lot of lab time of school. Yeah, that's true. Uh, don't worry, we'll help you with, <laughs> with the chat. Don't you don't need to catch it up if we have. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll give comments. you we'll give you questions from the chat or from ourselves. So yeah. don't worry. Elvis me <laughs> just mumbling around. <laughs> no, okay, so let's say that the book is divided in three parts. The first five chapters are designed to learn containers, K3S, and install your, let's say, to set up your K3S cluster, just that. Okay. The first five, five chapters are the basics, basic theory about containers, how to con compile conti containers for ARM using Python, Java, uh, go and uh, what else rust that are like the top languages for H, let's say and uh, the chapter two and three and four let's say that this a uh, basic configuration for the cluster networking storage uh, different components that you have to install on on the cluster some optimizations which operating system to choose but the summary of that chapters or the chapter two, three, and four is in the chapter five. That is like the summary of the of that chapter, just to start quick. So in the chapter five, let, let me see. You have like, I think that I have some slides here to run a little bit fast on, on that. Let me see, where is it? Yeah, I put a trivia question on the chat. I asked people, like, without looking online, if they know what ARM stands for, or ARM stands for. Not that I am yeah, smart. Yeah. I just I just learned it from the book. <laughs> Did okay. Let's say that because I teach operating systems, that's another thing. I teach operating systems. Why ARM? The reason is, like, I can give an example about uh, using your smartphone. The smartphones doesn't have Intel processors, microprocessors, use ARM, right? But yep. what's the reason behind that? Also, I understand that, let's say that here in the university, we have like a, a kind of final test in the car, in, in the in, in systems engineering, let's say. So I remember that was a case about why Intel and why ARM was best. So what sits better for some use case. So I the learned CPU that architecture you're referring to, right? Yeah. So let's say that ARM uses less energy and is less powerful than Intel. That means that your device is going to have like better battery life. Exactly. Yep. For example, if you have Intel microprocessor in your smartphone, the battery life will be pretty, pretty bad, right? But because ARM yep. is pretty balanced between power and energy consumption, you can have like more uh, battery life. So that's what's better for a regular user using, using smartphones, right? So that's yep. one of the reasons. Intel really shines. I know, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and then now like the, the ARM uh, architecture, the, which stands for risk. Uh, the CPU risk, right? Our advanced risk uh, machines, uh, ARM mm -hmm. got into the servers, right? Into servers, and then now they're in the like where you can rent them on the cloud, um, mm -hmm. and they're like the cheaper, and to, they got so better that they they meet uh, the performance of some Intel Intel or AMD CPUs and cost less. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are like 
refactoring their applications now recompiling. I, I think you're going to cover that in the first chapter, like compiling it for a specific CPU architecture. Yeah, let's say that right now, as you know, maybe you have heard about the tag M sustainability group in on CNCF this tag. They are talking about environmental sustainability in general. Right now it's a yep. yeah, right now it's a hot topic in the industry. They have to reduce uh, carbon emission, consume less energy. So right now ARM uh, matches that that thing, use less energy, reduce uh, carbon emission. So that's the importance right now for ARM microprocessors, right? So right now the edge is important because right now in the in the cloud providers, they mentioned that you have an edge cluster or edge server, or I remember that AWS had some services around it, right? So, yep. uh, so that's the importance right now about the edge, reduce energy and that kind of stuff. Yeah, the tag yeah, is yeah, I'm going to add the, the 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 link into the doc and also put it in the chat. The, we have a tag in CNCF for environmental sustainability. So if you want to learn more about that. Yeah. Um, so so go ahead, Sergio. So the chap you're going to show chapter one. Yeah, it's like a pretty like, like uh, the chapter one is like basics of how to compile a container using some specific uh, uh, architectures like ARM. Well, I think that the book is all the challenges to run all the stuff using an ARM microprocessor, right? Could be a Raspberry Pi, and this is, Orange Pi. Mm -hmm. And this is, since we're going to talk about Kubernetes and containers, right? Um, uh, the the first thing, this is the, one of the first uh, problems that you hit. And I like that the idea that you said that you wrote the book um, for a person that may be a hobbyist, right? Mm -hmm. And a hobbyist may not know what a container is. <laughs> they don't know what the purpose is. But he heard uh, from a friend or saw online that Kubernetes is the hottest thing, uh, mm -hmm. right? So it's I guess it's like uh, me now being trying to, or not trying, but I'm uh, starting to take a lot of classes around machine learning and artificial intelligence, right? And, mm -hmm. and you can say I'm a hobbyist in that. I'm an expert in Kubernetes and a hobbyist in the machine learning space. Um, but in this case, you are you are referring here that uh, since the uh, program needs to be compiled, uh, it needs to be compiled for a certain uh, architecture, um, mm -hmm. and and you're using you you're showing here how you do that in Go because Go is kind of popular in, in terms of Kubernetes uh, tooling and, con and containers, and the good thing about um, Go, I don't know if you mentioned in the book, is uh, Go can cross compile. Right, mm -hmm. you don't have to. For it used to be, I guess, back in the day. I don't know much about cross compiling, but I, I, I always assumed that you need to have. Um, I needed to compile my code in the in the. I had to have a machine in the in the university with that type of CPU, right? Uh, a Z or P P sixty four three ninety X uh, mainframe or Intel or to be able to compile to that architecture. Uh, so go is able to compile, re compile and target a different um, architecture, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, the, let's say that the book covers how to compile in a specific for ARM on different use cases, let's say. And I also decided, well, at the beginning, I tried to include all the examples of Go using Go, but I didn't know Go enough. <laughs> Do you have enough time to, to learn? included all the examples in Python, but I think that at the same oh, time, great. Python, because it's pretty easy to understand for the people that <laughs> doesn't know anything about programming, I think that Python suits, uh, fits better for the book. So, yeah. Hey, yeah, and also I matches uh, a lot of people that use, uh, well, back in the day when I started like learning what Raspberry Pi was, mm -hmm. and, and I bought the first one, Raspberry Pi, all the resources, tutorials, the programs, even a helper tool uh, to work with, uh, like with the hats and LEDs and things like that. All those programs were written in Python. Um, mm -hmm. uh, all, all, all of them that I can remember. Uh, Satish, you had a question? Yeah, Mintz, I am just thinking, what are the practical uh, use cases for this? Okay. Why would I run in the edge? Perfect. I think that I have I have that slide. It's like, let me see. I included.
like, ah, okay. This is a use case. Yeah. Let me show you. What's close to the end? <laughs> okay, here is a mountain. There is a river, right? Um, this is a, a 5, 5G tower, telecommunications and that kind of stuff, right? So let's say that you have a river. Uh, there is a sensor that is measuring temperature, humidity, uh, uh, the pH of the water or everything you want. And maybe you want to share that information in another location around the world, or maybe it's not necessary. So you have to send this information of the sensor. It's better to send the information or process the information locally to send that instead of send that information to internet and then have a result of processing that information because it's faster to do it locally, right? So instead of sending that information to the internet, you should do that locally. So the question is, the H refers to that, to process the information near to the source of the data. So a use case, so where is the H? The H is more or less here, <laughs> between the mountains, between the river, between the server, that's the H. You are going to process the information near to the source of the data. In which cases, maybe farms, maybe on rivers, maybe for traffic jam in the city, maybe for pharmaceutics, maybe to measure the tension of a bridge, maybe also for social networks, maybe you want to process information on your smartphone instead of doing the thing on the cloud, right? So basically H, you can use it for whatever you want, but right now are more focused, the use cases that the people are using for the H, it's more for local processing, like farms, domotics, robotics, rivers, and that kind of stuff, right? So that's the reason of the age. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so this is uh, this is really happening, right? I mean, you, you do see real life deployment. Okay. Yeah, so Satish, one, one very good example, one of the first examples in Kubernetes when we were doing KubeCon, that a company came and talked to the community about like uh, using Kubernetes on like weird places that we didn't think people were going to use it uh, was Chick Fil A. Uh, that's a that's a food, fast food chain here in the U.S. Um, and I think McDonald's also has it. But I I know for a fact Chick Fil A was one of the first companies having little devices of Kubernetes in the in the fast food store in the in the food store to process all the data that was happening with all the machines, to diagnostics of the machines, to process the payments of all that. So there's a lot of compute happening in a in a store. Um, that And they were using these tiny devices and they put it in thousands and thousands of uh, stores around the world. Um, and that's different from, I can, I'm going to date myself. Um, 20 years ago, I was working with a big uh, uh, company um that is like a a retailer and they were using compute at the edge processing like uh sometimes they do it for credit card transactions when like their internet is down and right. the store is in locations where there's well, no internet was only satellite and they were pro doing compute at the edge but guess what they had a rack server with big machines sitting in back in the back in the store and that was consuming a lot of electricity Right, it was hard to update, hard to carry. One of them was broken, and sending one. So now, I guess twenty years after, <laughs> we have these tiny devices, right? Like can fit like this one, uh, in that store, right? Doing the processing uh, with ARM ARM CPUs. Go ahead, Sergio. Yeah. Okay. I have an example here. Sorry, but this is in Spanish. I will try to explain it. It's improvised. This. For example, for preparing dishes or plants or something like that, uh, this example, I, pre I presented this on Argentina. They have some beverage that has milk and chocolate. So the idea, this is a use case application in food for edge computing. 
how to automate the preparation of a beverage, right? In India, there are like some kind of beverage that maybe you can automate, right? Using a little bit of robotics or something simple, like have a recipe to start the oven, have some machine learning model to know oh, nice. where to put the milk and the sugar, right? And when this, this well, here is the picture. Let, let me let me see. If you what, can... What's the machine model? Like you got me interesting. So what's the machine model <laughs> happening? With the sugar? Yeah, let's say that you can just like something simpler as, uh, let me see, as, as a decision tree. If happens okay. A, return B, you have to do B. If happens C, you have to do D, right? So something simpler as a decision tree. So, or yeah, maybe you I, are I, collecting. Yeah, I think I, um, I, I remember, I, I hear so many use cases, but I, I'm trying to remember one. One that I've been, and, I, and these are like now from my current, my current uh, job, uh, helping end users that I help at work, uh, that I know they use our technology to do machine learning, to take pictures in a manufacturing. Like uh, there's a lot of like things happening on the belt. So they're taking pictures to see like if there's defects in the, in the product. And they can like do it like a hundred times per second, right? These devices, uh, the products are going so fast that a human being cannot inspect that there's mm -hmm. like an error, a, a a defect in like in a board like this right here, this tiny resistor, right? That it was bad out of like maybe a thousand uh, products, maybe one has that has a resistor that is wrong, and just by taking a picture every uh, every like milliseconds, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then doing the machine learning in the manufacturing, they can mm -hmm. like detect that this product is run and then the machine would just throw it out on the box, right? And select which ones are not. Um, very impressive. Also really for agriculture, also do that. When they collect fruits from the field, they do machine learning uh, and processing uh, at the edge. Yeah, that's another stuff like, let's say that people use a lot of NVIDIA small devices because they process a, a really nice the the um, image classification algorithms computer vision and that kind of stuff gpu so, getting gpus yeah, uh GPU. on the edge on the edge right so yeah that's why maybe, I, I posted uh, a, a one that I, i'm thinking of buying I'm, i want to buy an nvidia nook uh it costs i think it costs 900 dollars but I'm, I'm thinking about getting one of them <laughs> there is like let, let me see. Uh, for example, well, there's smaller I ones, like, I think. I'm, I want to get the biggest one. I think there's smaller ones that you can get GPU. Yeah. Let's say that, well, here's my cluster, right? Uh, so this is one individual node. And talking about GPUs, there is a, something called a, like neural, neural network accelerators that is a kind of USB device that is an external GPU that you can connect also for example, to a Raspberry Pi to increase the the processing of the images and that kind of stuff. So instead of I buying think... like something that includes all the stuff, you can have external GPUs like these neural network devices. So I like... think I saw this week um, Raspberry Pi release a uh, AI kit and it has oh, this yeah. device. That's so cool. I'm going to put it here in the in the chat. I think it was June 4th. Oh my God, I have such good memory for like useless things. I can remember <laughs> saying this. Uh, don't ask me how to uh, write a Docker file yeah. now uh, by hand. <laughs> I think that. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I saw yeah. this and I said like, I want to buy I, everything that I see something like this, I want to buy it. Um, but yeah, yeah, this one, uh, very cool. I was I was asking and you're you're highlighting that this is not necessarily the, the the GPU that we think is like uh, for gaming or the servers or the NVIDIA. This is like a smaller even footprint and power device, right? And it does a neural network. Yeah, let's say that that idea of the Raspberry Pis comes from the Coral devices from Google. Let me see. This is pretty similar. Yeah, the Coral is like... Uh, also comes from in um, M2 format. I get this one. And I remember that 
when this Raspberry Pi kit doesn't exist, the people was like trying to buy an adapter for the M2 device. Oh, USB. And okay. Yeah, so you can buy the Coral device as an M2 format. I don't know where is it. Ah, here is it. And then you the can put M2 it in your, plug it into your computer. I think there was one that you can just plug in your computer. To your computer, to a Raspberry Pi device, one other kind of devices. So comes in different formats. So I think that the Raspberry Pi kit is trying to do the similar thing. A nice. Other than a Raspberry Pi. So it's the same, the, the same idea. Yeah. Other nice. thing that is nice that when I was writing the book, I discovered another devices that already includes, includes support for this kind of Coral devices too. So like Rock PI. What's the, what's the website for that, Coral.io? Yeah, coral.ai. AI. Every oh I don't that's a I that's a missed opportunity. I don't have a Carlos.ai. I should get I should buy a domain <laughs> name. I have uh, I don't know how many domain names I have bought. Uh Eric, do you have a few? I don't know. Eric might buy uh used to be buying DNS domain names. Really? I buy a lot. I think all of them are expiring, uh <laughs> getting email notifications. Let, let me jump to the book again. <laughs> I okay. Let's jump to the chapter. Was a quick walk through chapter two installation. Chapter being some specific stuff for K3S. Yeah, let's go over. Up. Let's uh, just looking at the time. Let's go over like uh, what are the chapters we're going to cover in this in this series. So I think today we discuss chapter like the use cases and the why and then uh, we can go over like what are the things we're going to look into so people get excited and uh, if you're watching the youtube like join us every friday go ahead Sergio. yeah that's true so chapter two is about installing so i promise that next week i will have my raspberry pi running k3s i will have, i don't know if people does anyone has a device that they can also give that promise um or pledge <laughs> uh, yeah. something running something and, and that skips up uh, k3s skips up with the uh, um, we'll discuss maybe next week but i was going to talk about like why k3s is small what are the things that they do to keep it small in terms of scd but um one thing that i wanted to mention like k3s was checking the other day because we use it in testing in argo cd project they keep up with their with the versions of kubernetes like uh, they, with, as the new versions come out from Kubernetes, they, they support the latest version. Yeah, something about Argo CD is that when I was writing the book, they didn't support ARM. <laughs> so I decided to find another kind of solution. So Flux in that moment support ARM. So that I learned that because Flux is a little bit minimal, let's say, compared yep. with Argo Best CD. Controllers. Yep. Feature K3S. Nice. So maybe that's the second challenge. I should get Argo CD running on a my Raspberry Pi. <laughs> yeah. A, a version of it. Uh, uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, Argo CD have done improvement in terms of ARM and I mean, sick scalability, trying to get it uh, more performant. Uh, but you can get a version of Argo CD that is, uh, we call it the core, that you only need maybe the app controller mm -hmm. and repo server, like two tiny two tiny uh, pods, you don't need the rest. Oh, uh, go ahead, what is chapter two? So this is the part that uh, the process to install, install K3S uh, inside the operating system, right? The Linux operating system in your device. So the first thing is to install Linux, right? On the, the, on yeah. the Raspberry Pi. Yeah, something that I learned about that was like, let's say for example, a Raspberry Pi, if you take a Raspberry Pi for that, is that the Raspbian that is the default operating system for the Raspberry Pi? I think just it feels a little bit slow compared with Ubuntu. So I prefer to use Ubuntu for this kind of configurations. I don't know why, but feels more stable than that the Raspbian. Yeah, I'm going to look I for use... my my uh, re I have a repo where I did my first K3S with Knative and I I think I use one of the two. I, I remember I use a tool called KSOP, uh, K, 
like ketchup, <laughs> I guess. Ah, yeah, yeah, from, yeah. Alex, from Alex, uh, from OpenFast, um, Alexis from OpenFast, and he helped me uh, with his tooling and stuff, and it's very popular. So it's a, it was a super easy way to to get it installed with case case yeah. up. I'll put a link in there, maybe for for people that want to try it this week and have it ready uh, next Friday. Ah, yeah, that's true. I think that I have like some GitHub repository. Let me see. Because I worked on something similar in the previous. Oh, I got a Knative. It is very old, so don't, don't judge folks. Um, put it here, but um, I think it was set up Knative on Raspberry Pi in five minutes. I think that was the goal. And I use Ubuntu. Yes, I also I need to confirm. I used to want to have screenshots to tell people like exact because there were multiple Ubuntu images and I'm like I don't know which one to use, so I used the Ubuntu 20.10, which I guess that's very old, uh, for Raspberry Pi 3, 4, and 400. So you have to pick uh, one that is compatible with your Raspberry Pi if you're going to if you're going to use Raspberry Pi or you, if you're going to use a like a small machine or a small laptop. Like one of, an, another thing that people can do is um, I've been buying these Nook devices. Mm -hmm. Um, so I don't know if people can see it. Can you see it? And, and it has a sticker of, uh, Goofy, I think, or Mickey Mouse, because I don't know which one is which one. So I give a server name of like a Disney character. <laughs> um, and, um, these ones you can get on eBay use very cheap. Uh, they don't cost that much. Uh, so at least, uh, eBay or other places where they sell used things, you can buy a used little computer, um, uh, because sometimes I think at, at one point Raspberry Pis people were, were on so much on demand that you can get one like uh, for example the the CM4 module. <laughs> the cheap feel, eh? okay. Let me see what else. How much of the work demos you plan to do are K traces specific? Well, I think that in the book it's just all around K traces. So. Yeah. But at the same time, let's say that, for example, you use Talos or K0S or something similar, because this Kubernetes wo works in the same way, right? So it's like pretty I, agnostic. I, I'm, I'm glad that you, you say that, because that's kind of like the theme I was driving for the 10 year anniversary of Kubernetes. Uh, that it gets to a point that stuff should work because use Kubernetes mm -hmm. is Kubernetes. Like um, it doesn't matter which distribution is mm -hmm. it's Kubernetes, like kubectl apply and kubectl create deployment, right? It's the same process. Um, Let's say that the other thing that the book doesn't covers like two, uh, let's say complicated examples, just doing a lot of things using basic concepts around Kubernetes. So you don't have to be afraid that the examples are not going to work as the same way or something similar. Maybe there are some chapters because of the versions of the software that I use, like for storage. Yep. Okay, Nelly, change a little bit, but I also include the official links if, just to check if the installation is different right now. Let's say, for example, in the book, the current command to install k is changing in the last year. Oh, so. change. Okay. Yeah. So, but right. the but the thing that we can tell people, like if you're watching or you're here, um, like in the and we're going to be talking about this topic and the book for the couple of weeks. So use the Slack channel, right? So as you hit a problem or something, Sergio, uh, is going to be active for a couple of weeks with us. So, uh, in an ASIC manner, right? We'll pose a question of like if something doesn't work on the book. Uh, then post a question, and that could be something that we can send back to pack as an errata, right? Let's call it errata. Mm -hmm. um, errata. And then we can yeah, update exactly. the, the book on the next edition or anything. So if it doesn't work in there. One thing that I would say I'm looking forward is databases. Because um, already for me, we're running a container. But uh, I think I saw one of your demos in one of the KubeCon talks that uh, that was the, the time back then that I learned that you run a database. I don't know if it was MySQL or you run a database, but the oh. thing that I was excited about was you use Grafana to talk to SQL. I didn't know Grafana has so many like uh, protocols. I took Grafana back in the day. 
uh, only talk to Prometheus. Uh, you have Grafana talking SQL to the database to get status of a sensor that you were updating in the device. I was like, I don't know if people like were like like me understood what you did on stage, but like, oh my God, I learned so much in your like 20 minutes that you did your presentation. That was like, I went back and like, oh my God, can Grafana kind of like do SQL? And then that's how you were able to get something running with the minimum thing running, right? Because like, if, mm -hmm. if you put all the things that we use in the cloud, like you're going to install Prometheus and you're going to install Grafana and you're going to install a pod that scrapes uh, SQL and SQL monitor, it's like doesn't run on the Raspberry Pi, right? You, so you went with a solution that is well, very simplistic. Mm -hmm. Let's is this an exa example? Do you have it in the book or that was something for the demo for the talk? Let's say that I reused some part of the code and I adapted the thing to create an, a different demo. Let's say that the hardware part is different, but the concept and some code are similar. Also, I yeah. have the GitHub repository too. So in your house, um, like in the terms of that, you can have Grafana, right? Directly, talk, you can create a Grafana dashboard just talking directly to these devices, right? You don't have to run Grafana in the device. You can run Grafana in your computer somewhere else and then target the tiny SQL die, like or SQLite, I guess <laughs> you can even use SQLite. Uh, Grafana talks SQL. Yeah, let me see just to, because of the time, just to share how is a structured uh, chapter. Uh, okay. The basic topics, some part of, well, the technical requirements, some theory behind about what you are going to do in the chapter some pages about theory etc and then the practical part the coding part or the installation part at the end of each chapter there are some questions that may you you can work on the, it there is a summary some questions that you can oh there's ask. there's a so, quiz uh, Prof, yeah. mr professor mendez you, <laughs> you have us us uh, do uh quizzes uh on the book very interesting. Yeah. I like it. I like it because that's a challenge, right? Keeps a reader active of like, did they really uh, understand the concepts, right? Yeah. So let's say that in general, you can use the book, not for learning K3S or edge computing. So you can use the book also to learn Q the Kubernetes basics. Oh, interesting. Another maybe so fun way learning. of learning Kubernetes, right? Yeah. So you can learn how to prepare a cluster or you can avoid the cluster and pay something on the cloud. Then you can learn how to deploy things using services. Out, uh, let's say doing a simple continuous delivery stuff and find out using databases, uh, dashboards with Grafana, uh, what else? Uh, containers compilation and use cases using APIs, uh, database access, something that is pretty basic, but you can do a lot of things with that basis. So you can use this book to learn Kubernetes too. Perfect, perfect. And that's one of the things that we do here in the book club, right? People come at different, they're maybe new. I don't know if there's people new. You can put in the Slack, um, in the chat, if you are, we are new or very this is your first time here. Uh, but yeah, some people come here like like to talk, to listen in, maybe ask questions uh, because they're new to Kubernetes, right? Or they want to get better at it. Uh, Kubernetes has multiple uh, parts to it. And you mentioned like running databases, right? Maybe that's something that you don't do at work, but you can run a, a database and then like ask questions of like, well, how do I deal with storage on my little uh, Raspberry Pi? How do I deal with databases and stateful workloads with my little device? Um, how do I back up um, the database from my Raspberry Pi to another device in my house, right? Or in the cloud to S3, for example, <laughs> if you are not trying to sell anything here, but uh, to, to the cloud somewhere, object storage uh, uh, to do backups, right? So you can like uh, learn to do kind of like operations, right? And maybe you're a software developer, you don't work with the Kubernetes side of the house, but you're maybe curious and you do it with devices. Yeah. Oh, networking. Yeah, you have networking. You cover networking here. Uh, a lot of uh, concept that people get the struggle with. 
and yeah. Kubernetes. So it also covers all the necessary things to deploy your application. So, so you use tra good. traffic. Uh, I think traffic is the one that comes with K3S, if I remember right. Yeah, I remember traffic from my book because all the people knows how to use Nginx, right? So yeah, I yeah. focus more on that. Because oh, you were able to do the examples with Nginx in the book? Yeah. All the stuff. Oh, perfect. Perfect. Usually I, when I search online for, for tutorials in K3S, they always mention traffic. But if you have Nginx, that's mo most common. A lot of people use Nginx yeah. as an ingress controller. I want to say most useful, like most, most people like uh, end users that are work at work, um, they have Nginx as an ingress controller in the in the Kubernetes cluster uh, on the cloud, and then they have a like a low a cloud load balancer in front of the NGINX. Um, also, let's traffic. say we just focus it on what if a DevOps guy is, wants to work on edge computing. So that's the reason to include ha some hardware use cases here. So our pretty and you have Git also. Yeah, that's yes. actually was the question I was gonna go ahead Tim. going to raise was. Um, uh, and it's, apologies, I, I signed in a little late, so you may have covered this, but have you yet defined sort of, I mean, this is a Kubernetes uh, group, uh, and you said this is a great place to learn Kubernetes, but obviously the discrepancy here is really about resource constrained, uh, you know, environments. Have you actually defined that yet? Um, I'll, I'll come next week and plan to, you know, kind of wipe one of my little devices to, with a flavor of Kubernetes, I'll probably put K3S on there, but how resource constrained uh, do we have in mind? Like what's, um, you, you said our Raspberry Pi earlier, is that, is it just sort of a whatever, or do we want to kind of try to keep some sort of metric there involved like, uh, or barometer or threshold for what is, uh, what is, what does the edge mean? Ah, yeah, the concepts around, you, you mean the basics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, let's say that in my original presentation <laughs> for today, I cover, uh, let me show you. Okay. I think I have okay. Raspberry, I have the Raspberry 3. I don't have a Raspberry 2, but I think Raspberry 3 only had 512 of memory. Didn't have much. I barely got... Mm -hmm. Kubernetes running, uh, but KT, K0S is a very good one. It can get, uh, I can get uh, the links so we can take a look into, if you want to know, like if, if what you want to discuss, just have a, a small discussion and we can prepare for next week. It's like, what is the mm -hmm. smallest place that we can get Kubernetes, I say Kubernetes running, right? And and, and do right. something, running a, running a process, I guess. Yeah, I think that a Raspberry Pi four gigabytes is enough. It's not the best, but okay. it's going to work. <laughs> it's not necessary that you should buy like the eight gigabytes, the Model B or the five. Oh no, no, no. The the latest Raspberry Pi three uh, works, but I would say if you can spend money, get the the latest one. I think the five also, is the, the latest one. Also, not to promote AWS or Google, you can use the ARM virtual machines. Yeah, if you want to play with ARM, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We have in AWS, we have Graviton and those type of things. Now, then maybe you can buy a device if you want. Yeah, that's true. That's true. If you want to play with ARM and learn about these things, uh, you can do it. You can do it online, mm -hmm. and and get a machine and also like remember to stop it. <laughs> um, I use things like DevPod um, from Loft Labs. That is a uh, a system that you uh, run a dev pod and it will spin up a cloud VM. And then when you run, close your VS code, it just shuts down the, the VM. So you don't get charged for the running uh, running machine. You pay for this little storage, but um, the machine is the one that costs more. Let's say that for the next session, I, I'm going to have this homework, like how to install K3S in, the, in a cheaper device with not too many memory, and maybe you can decide in the next session which ah, Raspberry yeah. suits, suits better for you, maybe. So I am going to change the smaller one, and you can judge 
about how that device is going to work, right? Yeah, I can, I'll try to do the Rust. You have a smaller device than the Raspberry Pi 3? What's the smallest one that you have? The previous one. Two? Yeah, smaller one, yeah, I think so. Uh, we if, you're, uh, if you're uh, interested in, in how how resource constrained we can get, I'm, I'm happy to guinea pig that. Um, I've got a lot of devices that are would be even more challenging. Uh, oh, which ones you have? What are the just minimum a, devices that you have? Just uh, it's like, well, minimum is probably just like a, an ESP32 or STM32, but like I'm thinking more about like a an R, like a R, RP2040, basically the Pi Zero, uh, or things that are just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Pi Zero. Bit, uh, it's gonna yeah, be think, pretty. Yeah, Pi Zero. I think. Um, Maybe not. <laughs> uh, Alexis, Alexis have done work um, from OpenFast. Um, um, he have done work with I some of the tutorials that that I follow is from him. He even have a course and a video course for for Raspberry Pis um, and then K3s. I think for for Cito, I don't remember that he was able to get Kubernetes running, but he was able to get OpenFast like a like a like a container running. Um, yeah, the container. I think that he played with container. D. Maybe container. And use container D or Docker. Maybe like that's that's where you want to stop. Like. Uh, you install Docker uh, or a container. Let's say you install a container runtime, and then you are out of resources. Like you, you don't have space to install Kubernetes, right? Um, so yeah, let's do let's plan for that, Sergio. Next uh, next week. Um, and again, also, this. Go ahead. This one is pretty important. The SD card. This one is nice. Yep. Yeah. Not less than that. Trying... The writing. Let's say that the speed of writing, yeah, that the speed of writing for this SD card is good. So the Raspberry Pi is going to feel if it's a slow, a slow device to write information. So it's pretty important the SD card, the speed of this one. As yeah, faster as yeah, yeah. The the size matter. Like this is sixty four gigs, which is a bunch. But the uh, way uh, getting a faster speed, right? I think that's usually the class class nine, class ten. Uh, look for uh, and these things are very cheap now, like compared to maybe ten years ago, right? This this it's amazing that you can get like one terabyte <laughs> in your in, in a ten, in a nail uh, in your nail as big as your nail. Um, and yeah, get get the faster speed because then you will like see. Um, uh, for things that write uh, write a lot, uh, things like etcd, for example, right? The database, since you're doing a lot of uh, watches and patches, the database is writing to disk. Those are the things that will be writing to disk. And then, like Sergio said, like if you install a database, um, it will be writing there. But um, and then you will see errors if you don't get a faster uh, SD card. Uh, so mm -hmm. if you're going to buy one, buy the the, the right one for that. Yeah. Um, and then also, I'll say you're planning for, maybe for next week. And since we're talking about uh, things to to get, um, I for Raspberry Pi, there's a thing called I don't know if, uh, this would look correct or not. Does it look mm -hmm. correct now? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. So this is this is a device called the Hat H A T, and it's mm -hmm. a something that you plug on top of your Raspberry Pi. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not part of the Raspberry Pi, but it's something that you can buy uh, if you want to play with sensors um, or uh, outputs and inputs. So uh, this white thing that you see here is an LED uh, screen um, that not not a screen, but an LED light kind of like um, space of like, I think it's 10 by 10 and you can do like colors and letters and make it run. And it has a joystick, and I think it has a sensor for temperature. Um, so if you're not, if you're afraid of like playing with wires, right, and having the board and anything like that, this one is something that you can snap in and feel safer around like electricity or like uh, if you're afraid <laughs> of damaging it. <laughs> or if you want, you can go like in the university and play a little bit with this. Yeah, I yeah. Have that one also. Actually, yeah, I have I have too many things. They're they're hitting because my wife was telling me like I had too many too many electronics around the desk and the area. Uh, so they're 
in there. So I get them. I'll get them out next week. Um, so I think we're at top of the hour. A lot of uh, a few folks are already leaving, uh, but I want to say thank you for everyone that joined today. Uh, thank you, Sir Sergio, for joining the Kubernetes Book Club, um, as other book authors have done. Um, so we'll follow the same format of like the book author basically answering questions and uh, joining us every Friday uh, for a couple of them and and to discuss this topic uh, on running Kubernetes on small devices uh, and the, and also like the interesting things that we can do with it, right? Because it's not in Kubernetes, it's like part A and then you do keep CTL, get notes and like, meh, right? I, you got you got that far. Uh, what what interesting things can we do with it, right? Uh, like the... And, the, the networking, the database, the Grafana, uh, a sensor. So, and Sergio can show us all his toys uh, for the couple of weeks and get them working. So um, be on the lookout in Slack. And then if you have questions and if you start like installing it and, and trying on, and you have problems putting Slack, uh, we'll do the same and we'll work together on that. So parting words, Sergio, anything to add? I think that the challenge for all this class <laughs> for the book club is like the class create, yeah the class yeah is like to create a cluster and each of us have a note for this cluster <laughs> sharing the yeah the, the, the that's homework levels. i'm yeah. i'm really pleased that um we are now reading a book that people can play with their toys so finally yeah, they're yeah. out of drawers yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> i have some instructions to set the device and join the yeah. cluster globally I think that I can do it. Yeah, I think that yeah, I yeah. can do it. Um, that that could be an experiment um, to join uh, our 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 little machines together into a cluster. Um, where yeah. I can set up something in the cloud mm. um, and get them in there uh, with an agent. If we if we want to write some code, right, we can write an agent um, that connects to the cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, thank you, Sevi. Any parting words, Sevi? What do you think about today? We have a professor, we have homework, we have quizzes even. <laughs> it's getting yeah, serious. Have, there. Uh, there are quiz <laughs> questions in the end and everything. No, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I've am i started considering, I'll go look into the office because I know there was some, you know, pies lying around here and there. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe I, I, I can make them work or maybe I'll invest them myself. Yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. Or work um, as as in Slack, nice like who has say, a who has a uh, Raspberry Pi with dust that they can borrow for for a month, right? For four weeks, uh, I bet somebody will say they have a few uh, to lend you. Um, but if not, yeah, we we can. Uh, we'll, we'll, it's a learning experience, right? So you don't don't get stressed if you don't have a device. So you, I bet you're going to learn a lot in here and ask questions. So thank you so much. We'll see you next Friday, as always, in the Kubernetes Book Club. Thank you, Sergio. Thank you, Sevi. Thank you, everyone, Thank you, everyone. Uh, that came Join today. Again. And if you're watching and want to learn this stuff, uh, join us on every Friday, right? Same time, same place. Uh, look us up. Thank you so much. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye. Have a great weekend. Everybody.